Nine years ago, Five Nights at Freddy's, an indie horror game, was unleashed from its shackles and revealed to the world. At its release, this game was widely regarded as one of the scariest games of all time, if not THE scariest. The animatronic characters fell exactly into the uncanny valley, their inhumanity and robotic appearances serving as the main horror factor. So why is it that characters that look like this, characters who are possessed by literal children, mind you, are so commonly drawn and depicted like this? If you've been on the internet for more than, like, three days, you'll be familiar with the term shipping. This term refers to the want for two characters to be in a romantic relationship. For instance, you would say, I ship this character with this character, meaning you like to imagine that these two characters are in a relationship with each other. Now, there's nothing wrong with this, really, as long as the relationship isn't immoral or illegal. But is wanting FNAF characters to smooch really appropriate? considering most of them are possessed by dead eight-year-olds and probably smell like 13 layers of shit? Well, as it turns out, maybe. In the most recent official FNAF game, it's implied that two animatronic characters may actually be in a romantic relationship. Or, if not romantic, at least a very deep and real friendship. Meaning that these characters can feel deep bonds like this with each other. But how exactly did FNAF ships start? which ones are cute and make sense, which ones are nonsensical and borderline offensive, and is it possible that there is actually a canonical romantic relationship between two animatronics after the franchise existing for nine years without any? Um, guys? Is this Freddy Fazbear? Har, har, har. Even after the release of the first game, the first four characters were being shipped with each other. Foxy and Chica, Chica and Freddy, Freddy and Bonnie, Bonnie and Foxy, Foxy and Freddy, Bonnie and Chica, Polyamory. Pretty much all of the characters were shipped with each other at this point in time. None of these ships were particularly more popular than the others, as none of them had actual substance. But it's possible Chica and Foxy were the most popular. There were even some special individuals who shipped the animatronics with the night guard, or to some extent, themselves, as there really weren't many characters at this time. The FNAF community, especially the shipping, grew substantially with the release of the second game. With the addition of newer, cleaner versions of the previous animatronics, some parts of the community began shipping these versions with the previous ones, especially Toy Bonnie, who a lot of people thought was a girl, and Bonnie, but more popularly, Foxy and Mangle. Mangle was essentially just a pink, girly-looking version of Foxy, so obviously there was a lot of people shipping the two, as well as people who thought they were siblings. Both of these are actually somewhat plausible, as a lot of the time kids' characters will have an opposite gender counterpart to be their sibling or lover. Foxy and Mangle quickly skyrocketed to the most popular pairing in the fandom. They're recognizable in somewhat simple character designs, as well as the fact that they're both foxes, a commonly chosen favorite animal of young fans, helping with their popularity. Not too long after the release of FNAF 2, animator Tony Crynight posted a minute-long, very 2015 reminiscent animation of Foxy and Mangle. In the video, the two kiss and fall in love, and Chica, who is head over heels for Foxy, as before Mangle she was the most commonly shipped character with him, is absolutely heartbroken and furious. Now this series is probably the main causing factor for why shipping culture is so popular within the FNAF series. A lot of people, myself included, watched these very videos as a child. So, this is primarily what I'll be talking about for this section, as it's likely the first thing that comes to mind when someone talks about early Five Nights at Freddy's shipping. Shortly after this first part, a second episode was released where Chica beats the shit out of Mangle, giving him the iconic look we know and love her for. In the next part, Mangle falls into a depressive state, and Foxy comforts them. We then see Chica regretting what she did to her, and searches for Mangle's blueprints to attempt to fix him. In the next part, she shows the blueprints to Bonnie, and he agrees to help with it, and they start flirting or whatever. Mangle also decides that he is in her Joker arc, and turns insane towards the end. In the next two parts, Mangle takes her revenge, beating the shit out of Chica and Bonnie, but is stopped by Foxy before they're able to cause any permanent damage. She then runs away, and Foxy gets all sad over it. In the next part, Foxy expresses his anger towards Chica for what she did to Mangle, and she confesses to everything. They all go out in search of finding Freddy and plan to fix Mangle together. Part 8 was a massive turning point for this animated series, as it was the first part with proper voice acting, as well as the first to include Springtrap. We'll get into the weird connotations of Springtrap wanting to marry the animatronic characters later. 
For now, we'll just breeze through this recap. Springtrap wants Mangle to marry him, as he possesses magic rings that are able to transfer consciousness from one being into another, and threatens to shut down Foxy with a button if she doesn't agree to it. Mangle reluctantly agrees and is miserable with this decision. We cut back to the rest of the animatronics all talking for a few minutes straight, just to show off the fact that they have voices now, I guess. They confront Freddy and he's like, handling finances or whatever, I don't know. Freddy makes a pretty good point here. No kidding! You mean after you suddenly made her name make sense? In the next part, we return to Springtrap and Mangle. He and Fredbear ran the pizzeria, and one day Freddy shows up. And they have creative differences. They have a big fight, and Fredbear ends up being crushed, with Springtrap going into hiding. He uses his magic wedding ring thing to transport Mangle's consciousness into Fredbear's body, giving him life. There's a genuinely really well-animated couple of next parts, with fight scenes and everything. Foxy loses his memories, Springtrap, like, dies or whatever, and Mangle snaps out of her trance. Later we see Mangle getting repaired, and Foxy still doesn't have any memories. Mangle decides that he'll love Foxy anyways, even if he doesn't remember her, and Foxy shows that he is once again developing feelings for them. I know that you will never get your memories back, Foxy, but I, I don't care. When I look at you deep down, I know you'll always be the same fox that I gave my heart to. No matter what. Maybe it's just a matter of time, but... Uh, <coughs> I hope that one day you'll look at me and feel the same. The series was truly a product of its time, where lore and convoluted stories weren't in the picture, and a large group of people really just had a passion for robots falling in love. The series is actually really well produced, albeit cheesy, and is definitely worth a rewatch. It came out at the perfect time as well, while FNAF was at its peak and a lot of us longtime fans were younger, easily drawn to ships like these and animation. These videos went crazy viral and to this day have millions and millions of views. When I was younger, I genuinely remember believing this was like, the actual FNAF lore. This series was basically Twilight for us FNAF fans, dividing people who shipped Foxy and Chica and those who shipped him with Mangle. But it also somewhat introduced a third, more strange ship, being Springtrap and Mangle. Predating the release of these videos was another video created by Quiet Tomato titled Springtrap Meets Mangle. This stemmed into a longer series primarily about Springtrap and Mangle, with some story and good old-fashioned, fun, classic FNAF art series things. The creator is still alive and kicking and even draws the two of them from time to time. I strongly recommend looking at his content as it's some real quality stuff. Regardless, this is likely what may have inspired Springtrap's plotline in Tony Crynite series, and some people took these two and shipped them as well, for some reason. Now, at FNAF 3's release, it's not like we didn't know that William Afton, then only known as Purple Guy, was Springtrap. A lot of these fanfictions either came from people who hadn't fully played the game yet and discovered the secrets and lore, or just people who didn't really care, making Springtrap more of a separate character in their eyes. Looking back at this content now is definitely pretty weird, as now Springtrap and all his variations are the most iconic FNAF villains, typically known for being an adult man. So it's definitely very strange that people were shipping him with other robots, often robots with dead kids inside of them. I don't really have that much of a problem with this older stuff, however, as the lore wasn't really taken too seriously by this part of the fanbase, and I hold all of these characters and the dumb made-up relationships close to my heart. Hell, I shipped myself with Foxy and Mangle when I was like 9 or 10. We were polyamorous and my self-insert was essentially just Mangle, but all the pink parts were blue, because I was a boy, and blue is the boy color. It's also worth mentioning the early fan depictions of characters, like the Night Guards, the Phone Guy, and Purple Guy. A lot of people shipped the first two guards together, Jeremy Fitzgerald and Mike Schmidt, myself included. And honestly, I still quite like this ship today. There is something so charming about the fact that we don't really know anything about Jeremy. He could be anyone, really, and with a character as complex and traumatized as Michael, he could definitely use a positive person in his life. With Michael's tendency to pick up a job at Freddy's, it's also likely the two could have possibly worked together at some point. This ship is still somewhat popular in the fandom today. There was also the possibly more popular ship between Purple Guy, or Vincent, as the fanbase had named him, and Phone Guy. There wasn't really too much substance to this other than people liking the way they looked, and that they were the only non-animatronic characters at the time. A few people also theorized that Phone Guy may either be the killer or be working with them. We didn't really get any completely new characters from FNAF 4, so the shipping started to die down until Sister Location. 
a lot of people theorized, and still do, that Ballora could be William Afton's dead wife. So a lot of art of her in Springtrap was created. This isn't really too strange, and a lot of it, especially in recent times, is actually really cool and artistic, sort of a metaphor for the collapse of their relationship, and where they are now. There were also some really weird ships to come out of this, though. <laughs> One I remember being particularly somewhat popular was Baby and Ennard, which does not make sense for very obvious reasons. And besides that, Baby and Elizabeth are almost treated as like the same character, and Baby is just very much childlike looking in nature, so shipping her with any of these adult sounding, adult looking characters just gives me an ick. Then comes FNAF 6, my favorite, and we get more properly introduced to Henry, someone whose name had been mentioned before in the books, but who we hadn't yet to see or hear. The way he addresses William in the ending of this game confirms that the two were old friends, having started the business together. It would fall out, likely after Henry discovered William's crimes. Now this, at least for me, sparked something inside a lot of people, something I hadn't quite yet understood the full meaning of back then. But William and Henry quickly skyrocketed to my favorite ship back then, as well as a lot of other people, mainly because they were the only human characters, really. But what I hadn't noticed at the time was that this would actually become one of my favorite tropes of all time. Toxic, codependent, doomed old man yaoi. What a mouthful. It was sort of a lovers to enemies type thing, and a lot of people really loved it, especially with the unlimited angst opportunities that the FNAF fandom loves so dearly. It's also worth mentioning that in the books, William has a strange infatuation with Henry, even having a secret tunnel in his basement to his house. This isn't to say or suggest that the two were actually canonically romantically involved, but it definitely fooled the fire. That's essentially it as far as the early FNAF ships go. These ships were quite literally everywhere. If you search any of them, or just anything along the lines of my favorite FNAF ships, you'll probably get some good quality 2010s FNAF PMVs and poorly edited slideshows with Nightcore in the background. Truly the best days of Five Nights at Freddy's, and definitely what Scott Cawthon expected and intended for his creation to go. Oh, cholera! Czy to Freddy Fazbear? Oh, 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 oh. There isn't much to say for FNAF VR, as I think the only real ship to come out of this was Vanny and William Afton, which is just really weird to me, I guess. I know they're both adults, so technically I guess it's fine, but it's still a worrying age gap, and also Vanessa is literally being manipulated, so yeah, not the best. However, this would make its way into Security Breach, a game that rekindled this fire in many fans' hearts. People who had grown up with these ships in videos around six or seven years ago were older teens and young adults now. People who looked back at those silly videos and drawings fondly. And Security Breach gave us something we had never really had before. Fully sentient, non-possessed animatronics with full personalities. These animatronics had full characters and interacted with each other and the world around them in a very human way, seeming to hold proper conversations. And some of them, like Roxy and Freddy, even having silly moments reminiscent of early FNAF comic dubs. Freddy, get out of my room! It was as if every part of that old section of the fandom had made its way into a real FNAF game. These characters had actual feelings and opinions about each other. Once again, essentially everyone was shipped with everyone. Typically, Freddy x Monty and Chica x Proxy were the most popular, as they were just most commonly depicted together. There was also a fifth character, though, never actually being seen in this game, this being Bonnie. At one point in Bonnie Bowl, Freddy brings up the fact that he does not come there anymore, as he misses Bonnie. We learned through collectibles that Bonnie had been leaving his room often at night, and one day was mysteriously destroyed, having last been seen in Monty Golf. This led people to believe that Monty had killed Bonnie, once again giving these characters more depth to their relationships. So for a while, the whole community had a pretty good angst, fan art, and fanfic set up. Monty killing Freddy's lover and best friend, and Freddy being sad about it. Yet, somehow, seemingly overnight, Monty was redeemed, as there was no proof of him committing this crime. And people even took to shipping Monty and Bonnie, and even Monty, Bonnie, and Freddy. It's also worth mentioning Chica and Roxy. Roxy is not so subtly the replacement for Foxy, and there's actually a good bit of evidence to imply that Roxy may have used to be some kind of Glamrock Foxy, as Foxy's areas were repurposed into hers, and their names and animals are suspiciously similar. With Foxy and Chica having previously been shipped together quite commonly, it was basically the modern-day incarnation of that, even the ship names, Foxica and Roxica, being similar to each other. Back on the topic of Bonnie, Freddy, and Monty, recently with the release of the Ruin DLC, we got our first proper look at Glamrock Bonnie, and learn a little bit about his backstory and relationships. As I mentioned in the previous video, Glamrock Bonnie, at least according to Fazbear Entertainment, retired and gave up his place in the band as well as his guitar to Monty. 
People are pretty 50-50 on whether or not this actually is what happened, but for the people who believe in this, it gives Bonnie and Monty a sort of new kind of relationship, with Monty likely idolizing Bonnie, looking up to him. It's possible either the fame got to him, or just the story was fake, as Bonnie is caught in Monty's little tornado at the end here. Something a lot of people did not expect from Ruin, however, was the implication that Freddy and Bonnie could possibly have had a romantic relationship. Or, at very least, a close one that could definitely be interpreted that way. Now, I know a good portion of you have either already clicked off this video by now, or are seething with rage at the fact that I could even imply that these robots could mean love. But, have a good listen to what I have to say. I'm not trying to reach super deep for anything that isn't there, and I'm not even saying that this is 100% true, and that these two characters are, for a fact, definitely in love. So take a moment to hear what I have to say, as you may change your mind, and if you don't, that's alright too. I respect everyone's theories and opinions as long as nobody is being harassed. That out of the way, let's take a deep dive into the relationship of Glamrock, Bonnie, and Freddy, and take a look at some of the evidence pointing towards a deep relationship or friendship between the two. One of the most important things to keep in mind is that throughout the entire series, Freddy and Bonnie have always appeared together, with the exception of FNAF 3, but Springtrap and Spring Bonnie are basically the same costume. The entire franchise started with Fred Bear and Spring Bonnie, the two faces of the restaurant. These characters also represented Henry and William, respectively, and their close friendship at the time was shown through these characters. In the first game, Freddy and Bonnie are together again, on stage together, now with the addition of Chica and Foxy. And the same for FNAF 2, 4, and 6. In Sister Location, Freddy and Bonnie are even more closely paired together, with Bon Bon being attached to Funtime Freddy. And as for the Rockstar variants, they're once again together here. The only game where these two don't really appear together besides FNAF 3 would be Security Breach, as Bonnie was nowhere to be seen. In the original game, we didn't have much to go off of pertaining to the relationship of Glamrock, Bonnie, and Freddy. All we knew is that Bonnie had been decommissioned, and Freddy missed him so dearly he didn't wish to visit areas associated with him anymore. Now, there are some even more subtle hints hidden within game and character design. While some of these claims might be slight reaches, I have some decent professional experience with character and game design, as it's something I study decently often. As for environmental storytelling, the Pizzaplex seems to mainly be associated with two shapes. The lightning bolt, present on Freddy, and the star. Before the reveal of Glamrock Bonnie, the only stars on a character were the stars of Monty's glasses. However, as shown in the Ruin DLC, these glasses likely belonged to Bonnie before. Bonnie is also shown to have a star symbol on his chest, similar to Freddy's matching lightning bolt symbol. Freddy is also commonly known to affectionately call people Superstar. It doesn't really take a close look to know that the Glamrock characters are based off of Glamrock fashion, a fashion and subculture that is absolutely gay. Bonnie's look seems to be very much inspired by the androgynous outfits of David Bowie, where Freddy is likely based off Freddie Mercury, two undeniably queer icons. Glamrock fashion and music were also very influential in gay culture, Bonnie and Freddy also each wearing matching earrings of the same type on one ear, something that was commonly used for gay men to identify others in the past. Within the colors of these characters also lies a common trope used for colorful characters who are often dating or just good friends. Complementary coloring. Complementary colors are colors that are opposite to each other on the color wheel, having maximum contrast for each other. The fundamental complementary color pairs include red and green, yellow and violet, and, you guessed it, orange and blue, the colors of Glamrock, Freddy, and Bonnie. Freddy is primarily orange and red with light blue highlights, where Bonnie is primarily light blue with red highlights and outfit. The red and blue trope is also somewhat common in media, especially when it comes to couples. So common that the term red and blue ships have been coined. Now, the most damning piece of evidence lies in a few words, written on a poster signed by Freddy and Bonnie's room slash area slash hideout. These words read, You and me forever and ever. Love, Freddy. In Bonnie Bull, graffiti can be found reading forever and ever, with hearts around it. Bonnie also exclusively keeps merchandise of Freddy in his room, where all the other animatronics only keep their own memorabilia. Freddy also keeps a blue bowling ball and pin in his room. Now, these words written on this poster can absolutely be said platonically. However, Freddy doesn't seem to interact with any of the other mascots in this way, despite being good friends with them and expressing sadness as Gregory continued to hand him their body parts. You and me forever endeavor is typically a more committed, romantic thing to say to someone. 
Now, what a lot of people aren't aware of is that these words are actually a reference to a song sung in Fazbear and Friends on tour, the promotional material for Security Breach, titled Forever and Ever. Some people use this to argue that these words don't mean anything, but I would argue otherwise. Signing a poster with love and referencing a song previously sung with the bandmate you sent the poster to sounds pretty suspicious to me. Beneath this poster is also a secret passageway to Fazerblast, an area where Freddy was likely a regular in. This could be a parallel to the tunnel that William had to Henry's house, as previously mentioned. But does all of this evidence mean that Glamrock Freddy and Bonnie are undeniably canonically in love with each other? Absolutely not. But I don't think it's too outlandish for people to believe this, given the subtext. Regardless of whether their relationship is platonic or romantic, it is definitely very deep and committed, and Bonnie and Freddy will always be best friends forever throughout the series. I don't see anything wrong with people wanting or believing that these characters are in love. It's not hurting anyone, and the majority of people aren't shoving it in people's faces and forcing it into the lore. It's all just good fun and can be a big source of comfort for some people, and we should all be respectful and accepting of other people in our discussions. Whether you like it or not, these two definitely have a very wholesome friendship, and for a story primarily about loss and tragedy, I think it's rather fitting to tell a story of someone losing his best friend, a story that had been told many times in this franchise before. Okay, I think I'm getting a lot better at this. My previous video was completed in less than a day, and I'd like to think I'm getting a bit better at talking to myself for an uninterrupted half hour almost every day. I'd really love to know what you lot personally think of Freddy and Bonnie's relationship, and which ships you may have loved or despised as a child. A quick thank you to my sprite artist, Frankie, and thank you to you as well, the viewer. The support I've gotten so far is truly amazing, and I strive to get better so I can create higher quality content for you all. Please let me know if there are any topics you want me to discuss, as while I have a couple of video ideas laying about, I'd love to know what you guys think. Until next time, I've been Quinnamon, and happy nine years of Five Nights at Freddy's. Bye!